Now this morning, I want to kind of look at this scripture again, because I want you guys to know something, that this scripture, honestly, is, it, it, I'm not going to say that it's my favorite scripture, because sometimes, sometimes I don't, honestly, I don't agree with it. Some of you are like, wait, what? No, but sometimes, sometimes I don't, because sometimes I find it hard to wake up and say, God, would you clothe me with compassion? God, would you, I know the meeting I'm going into. God, would you clothe me with patience? It's, it's a tough thing. But here, here's the thing. When you look at this scripture, and, and forgive me if this is your first time here. Forgive me if you're just kind of checking out church, because I'm going to be a little bit harsh right now. But if we lived this scripture, let me tell you, what a difference we would make if we lived this scripture. Do you know that if we lived this scripture, I said last week, we would give off a far better optic of who Jesus is. But do you know, do you know something? Do you know what would happen if we lived this scripture? We would see a magic trick. Some of you are like, what? What do you mean? we would see something disappear. That something that I'm talking about is an empty seat. If we, as God's people, God's chosen people, we're holy and we're dearly loved by God himself, if we chose to be less hypocritical and actually choose to put this stuff on, we would see empty seats disappear. Some of you are like, well, what's, honestly, what's the big deal with an empty seat? I actually kind of prefer not sitting beside anyone. Here, here's my issue with an empty seat. An empty seat has never given its life to Jesus Christ. This empty seat over here has never chose to get baptized. This one right here has never been made a disciple of Christ. People, some of you might be saying, well, you just want to be pastor of a big church. And I would say, yes, I do. Because it means that we're growing. And it means that we're accomplishing the mission and the vision that Christ, that God, has given us. So yeah, I want to see these seats full. And I'll be real with you, it's been awesome. This past year, we've seen, we've seen this growth that we, we honestly never saw the previous like four years of ministry. And so we're seeing it. But you know what, this is the thing. We, we can't just stay here. We need to be consistently growing, consistently reaching more people with the love that, hey, that we have in Christ Jesus. So hey, an empty seat, it's a serious matter. We, we here at Bridge Church, we take this very seriously. Because it, as you know, maybe, maybe you don't, but our mission statement here, our, our, our purpose statement, kind of like the, the why does Bridge Church exist, it's worded like this. It's like, well, we're, we're church, we're just, we're connecting people to Jesus one life at a time. Some of you might need to write that down. Some of you that are like saying like, this is my church home, but I just don't truly understand. I don't really know kind of what they're all about. Is this right here is what we're all about. We're going to be a church that connects people to Jesus one life at a time. And we get that statement. It's actually really great. We get that statement from the Bible. Some of you are like, awesome. You use the Bible here. Yeah, that's good. Right? But we do. We derive this statement from the Great Commission, right? Where Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them everything that I have taught you to do. See, that's a serious statement. And this is us being serious about a serious statement. Because we as a church are going to be, listen to this, are going to be followers of Jesus. We're not just going to simply say, hey, this is a statement. Let's figure out how Jesus can kind of get behind it. And, and it kind of it kind of dawned on me. You know, I was reading a book, and Matt, Mark Batterson said this statement. He said, you know what? It, it's like the church is growing, and that's great. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing people fall in love with Jesus. We're seeing people, like, filled with the Holy Spirit. We're seeing people, like, move and be disciples. But this is, this is my problem. He says, a lot of us, as believers or as churches, we say that we've invited Jesus into our life so that we can follow him. But a lot of times... We've just invited Jesus to follow us. But this statement is us following Jesus. You know, it's neat because our our church, that's our church mission. Our church vision is just simply to be an irresistible, unstoppable, life-changing church. And if you look at the word unstoppable, we actually pull that from Scripture too. Awesome. Right? Right? Because this, this is what this certain guy by the name of Gamaliel said in Acts 5. Basically, in a nutshell, he said, hey, what you're doing, like you can go ahead and try and stop the movement that's happening. They were going to stone this guy that was part of the way, part of Jesus' movement. He says, you go ahead and try and stop it. But let me just say, if, if his purposes aren't from God, if our purpose is not from God, then it's just going to falter. So don't even worry about it. But I will say this. If his purposes are from God, you can go ahead and stone him, but it ain't going to stop it because God's purposes are unstoppable. And so that's why we at Bridge Church hold this statement very near and dear to our hearts because that's what Jesus said to do, to go therefore and make disciples. I, I watched this uh, video clip this week, or actually a few weeks back, and it really hit me. It was by a guy by the name of Francis Chan. He's a pastor in a church in California, and he's known for basically just making the, the complexities of the Bible simple, right? And he's known for basically looking at Scripture and kind of understanding that, well, it, Jesus said it, so we need to do it. And he talked about, get this, he talked about that old game Simon Says. I don't know if you guys have ever played Simon Says, you know, that game where, you know, Simon Says, pat yourself on the head. Simon Says, like, tap your toes. Simon Says, do you know, quack like a duck, whatever, right? A lot of us, I'm sure, have played it, you know, unless, you know, you're younger and there's no app for that on your phone, right? But (laughs) Simon Says, you know, it's this great game that honestly every single one of us understands. But in the church... The game Jesus says takes on a whole different meaning, doesn't it? See, when Jesus says to do something, our response is just to do it. Like if I go to my son and I say, Javis, go clean your room. And he comes back to me two hours later and he says, Dad, Dad, I thought about what you said. I memorized it. In fact, Dad, I know it in Greek. Dad, you said, go clean your room. I, I, I wouldn't look at him and say, well done, I guess. Like, good, you memorized it? And then he continues on and he says, yeah, Dad, actually, I, actually, I was really thinking about what you said, so I'm going to actually have some friends over and we're going to kind of study of what you said and kind of think about what it would look like if I clean my room. And we're going to pray for people to come and clean my room. Are you catching this? See, when Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples, he's not doing it as a recommendation. He's not doing it as like a, hey, study this, memorize it, pull it apart, figure out what I I, I meant when I said, go therefore and make disciples. But a lot of us, honestly, a lot of us are doing that. 
A lot of us just look at that scripture and we say, man, that is great. I'm, I'm so glad I'm part of a church that kind of purposed its mission statement around the Great Commission, you know, like the, the thing that the, 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 the moment when Jesus was kind of giving the keys to the church to mankind and saying, I'm about to leave, but this is what I want you to do. And a lot of us look at that and we study it and we memorize it. We look like, what does he mean, disciples? Let's pull that word apart. See, when we, get, when we get to heaven and we stand before the judge, God's not going to be like amazed at how much scripture we've memorized. God's not going to be amazed at how many Bible studies we've attended. God's not going to be amazed at like how many times we lifted both hands in the air. He's going to say, did you make disciples? Did you, did you do what I asked you to do? I know, I know what you're thinking. This message is a little harsh. But honestly, an empty seat is a serious matter. An empty seat is a serious matter. We need to be the church. We need to be a church. We need to be individuals that don't just invite Jesus to follow us in this life that we're living. We need to be. That's why Jesus said, how many times did he say it? To the disciples, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. He didn't say, come and study what I do. Come and memorize the things that I say. Come, come. No, he said, follow me. And so I wonder, I wonder how many of us would say, you know what? Jesus, I want to do what you say. Because this is great, and I've said it. Earlier, and we looked at it just in the scripture before, where he said, above all, close yourself, clothe yourselves in love. Because that's essentially, that was Jesus' statement to the church, to the Christians, to the people that were part of the way, as far as this is, this is how I want you to be known. Right? He said, this new command I give you, love one another. And I guess, I guess the question is, is like, how, are, like, are we loving one another are we continually putting on compassion and gentleness and kindness and forgiveness and actually like loving one another? Because when Jesus says to do something, we're supposed to do it. And so it's great because here in the book of John, or 1 John, we see John actually teaching like this church, teaching these people that are believers, teaching these people that have already made the commitment to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And he goes and he reiterates what Jesus has said. And he says, this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, from Jesus. He himself said this, that we should love one another. And see, forgive me, but a lot of us, a lot of us that we choose to say, you know, I got Jesus on the inside. Yes, I do. I've got Jesus on the inside. How about you? We, we kind of stop there. And we just kind of like say like, yeah, I'm a Christian. But see, this is so great because John, he goes and reiterates, this is what we are supposed to be doing. We need to love one another. And then in case, in case he's not really clear as to who he's talking to, for, he goes and kind of expands on it. And he says this, he says, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us listen Show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. Did you hear that? Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. See, for too long, Christianity and, and, and the church in general has preached this message of like, you just got to give your life to the Lord so that you can stamp your ticket to heaven and spend eternity with God, which is honestly, it's awesome. It's so great that we can like basically say, God, I thank you for your redemption. I thank you for your forgiveness. And I thank you that I can spend eternity with you in heaven. But see, for those of us that kind of like, like do that, and then we kind of stop there. It's kind of like, like Jesus is like, but that's not the whole full meal deal. 
Yes, that's why I came. Yes, that's why I gave my life for you is so that your relationship could be restored with God. But listen, listen, if you want to be known as being part of the truth, you got to show it with your actions. Now, real quick, quickly here, a little disclaimer. Am I saying that you got to act on what you do, on what you have, in order to kind of have that relationship with God, in order to, you know, be quote-unquote saved? No, I'm not. Because the Bible see, the Bible's very clear. It says, for by grace, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not that of yourselves. Nothing that you can do. It's His grace appropriated through our faith that restores that relationship with God. So I'm not in no way saying that you gotta, you got to do this, you got to do that, you gotta, you got to make sure you're wearing compassion, you got to make sure that you're kind, you got to make sure that you're gentle, you got to make sure that you're patient. I'm not saying that in any way that that kind of like is, a, is, a, is a, like a, a blockage to your relationship with Christ. I guess, I guess what I'm saying though is... I guess, I guess it, it, it can be easily stated like this. It's, it'd be hypocritical to say that you need to do something for Jesus to be saved. Right? That's, that's this whole thing from Matthew 23 that we looked at in the previous couple of weeks with the Pharisees, you know, like doing all this stuff and, you know, putting on makeup when they're fasting to make, make it look like they're like worse off than they really were, right? Like doing all this stuff, putting scripture verses on their heads to make it look like they were religious, right? It, it'd be hypocritical for me to say you got to do something in order to earn your salvation with Jesus, However, let me just finish that statement because I believe it also would be hypocritical to say that you've got Jesus in you, but you're not willing to do anything for him. It's a tough statement, I know. We say it every single week at the end of service. We don't pass the giving basket around, you know, and do all that. We just simply say this one statement. You've heard Ken say it probably like, like 51 times. If you love Jesus and you love this church, you'll be motivated to give. And it's the very same thing in choosing to put on those clothes, in choosing to put on kindness, in choosing to put on gentleness. Because if you have Jesus in you, you should be motivated to live like Jesus wants you to live. I think, man, if we did that, what a difference we would make. Hey, if we chose as a church, if we chose as individuals to continually say, God, I'm ready to do what you want me to do, what a difference we would make for our city, for our neighborhoods, for our province. Like can, you, can you imagine? Here, here's a quick thing. Even, even financially, if we, if we actually chose to say, God, I'm going to give because I honor you and because you've asked me to honor you with, with what's near and dear to my heart, man, do you, can you imagine the finances that we would be able to sow into whether it be the food bank, into like school programs, into things that would, would make a viable difference for our community. You know, it's, I'll be real with you. Next week, um, my wife and I and some of the, the worship team members are, are going to Tabor because a good friend of mine, his name is Patrick uh, and, and his wife, Andrea, they just took over the lead role of the Tabor Lifelinks Church and it's a bit of a smaller church. And so unfortunately, they're only able to pay him half time. Which is like, you know, and he's like going into it and saying, I'm going to do it because I'm going to be faithful because God asked me to make disciples. And so I'm going to do what I can on a half time wage. Wouldn't it be great, listen to this, if we as a church had so many people that were full of like, God, I'm going to do something because you said that we had the finances to make up the other half time. Can you imagine being able to be a church that, that was that generous in wanting to see the gospel mission pushed 
that we would go and we would support another church? Honestly, guys, that's, that's unheard of. It's unheard of. But wouldn't it be great if we could? Wouldn't it be great if we could show that we belong to the truth, not by what we say, but what we do? I want that. So my question, I guess, this morning, is what can you do? What can you be part of here at Bridge Church? Because for some of you, I know that you've come in here and, 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 and you've just found this family and you've just been like, man, this is amazing. And I, I know that, I know that you've gotten something out of being a part of this church. You know how I know it? Because when I look at the volunteers in kids' church or guest services or media, it's all like brand new Christians. It's all people that would say, I totally caught God's heart for me. And so I want to do what I can so that God's heart can be caught in, others pe in other people. So, like, what can you do? Right? If you, if you know me, you know, I, I know I joke about this when I go out for coffee with new people that have kind of started coming to the church, and they've told me, hey, man, we love it here. Like, this is kind of like, this is, I think this is going to be our home. You know, I don't kind of beat around the bush. The, my, my first thing is like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do to be part of the solution for our hurting city? Because again, people, again, I believe, and I think you do too, that it'd be a little bit hypocritical to say that we got Jesus on the inside, but we're not willing to do anything about seeing that come to fruition in somebody else's life. So my question is, what, what can you do? Some of you might be thinking, well, I mean, you know, you kind of talked earlier about kids' church, and you just mentioned guest services. You just mentioned, you know, kind of these different things. But I just, I mean, I, I don't think I got what it takes to do that. I don't think that that's really my game. I don't really think that that's my lane. I don't think that any of the things that are available for me to do here are really necessarily kind of like, you know, like my, my skills and my gift sets or even, honestly, Pastor, my passions. And honestly, I get that. I get that it's our hope and dream here that your dreams would be accomplished. It's our hope and dream here that you would find your lane, that you would find something that brings you energy, that you would find something that brings you life, just like what Amy talked about. That's why I serve, because I care about it. I guess the question is, is how will you ever know what's your game if you never get off the bench? How will you ever know like, what you're good at if you just choose to sit in those comfy chairs every single Sunday morning? How will you know? It's like my son. You know, we can go tell him, and if you're a parent, I know you know this too, right? But your kids are like, I don't like that. Well, how do you know? You haven't even taken a bite yet. Just try it, bud. Right? How will you know that you won't like kids' church if you've never tried it? How will you know that you're not good with computers putting slides up on a screen if you've never tried it? How will you know that you can't make a difference in someone's life by saying, shaking their hand and saying, welcome to Bridge Church? How will you know Unle until you've tried it? How? Because this is the thing, guys, empty seats are a serious matter. I, I think of, and, and I know you've heard me tell this story before, but I think of this, this portion in Scripture, you know, where, where Jesus, it says Jesus was at, like, at this home in Capernaum, right? Jesus was there. He was like in the place. And this is what I find, even from the get-go of that Scripture, of that passage, it's like, hey, guys, Jesus is here. We have something to give. We have something to offer. We have something to, to give people. We've got Jesus, and he's in the house every single week. 
He's in the house every single Sunday. Because a lot of us, you know, like, I mean, when we do special services or different things, we're doing a dance or, you know, we've got, we've got like an Edmonton Eskimo coming and, and sharing his testimony. You know, those are like the highest attended services because people come when there's something here. This is the thing. We've got somebody way better than Nate Kuhorn from the Edmonton Eskimos. We've got somebody way better than the dance crew from Renew Dance. We've got somebody way better than an amazing opener from Shyla and the team. We've got Jesus. And so in this portion of Scripture, it says Jesus was in the house. And so it was like full. There was people there. And these four guys come because they've got this friend who's on a mat and he's paralyzed. And they say, this guy needs Jesus. And my question is, is, do you know anyone on a mat? Do you know anybody that needs Jesus? Do you know anybody that's like sick with divorce or sick with drug addiction or sick with pornography addiction or sick with, with issues and hurts? Do you have anyone on a mat? And these four guys, they carry this guy that's on a mat, that's sick, that needs Jesus. And they go and they try and get in, but they can't get in because it's surrounded, get this, by a bunch of people who are just sitting there. And they go and they see, well, we can't get in, so what we're going to do, we're going to climb up to the roof. And they go up to the roof and they begin to tear away the roof and they lower their paralyzed friend down to the foot of Jesus. And instead of saying, be healed, he says, your sins are forgiven. Instead of meeting what we think is their needs, Jesus come and, and, and he meets their need. So he says, your sins are forgiven. And immediately all the people that are sitting around, they have these questions of like, who is this guy? How can he say your sins are forgiven? You know, like all these questions of like, what is he doing? I think that's a little bit like hypocritical. I think that's a little bit like, like, like heresy, don't you think? And so Jesus goes and he reads their minds and he says, how can you say that? Is it, is it, is it, more, is it more like powerful for me to say your sins are forgiven or me to say you get up and pick up your mat and walk? And these guys are like, their minds are obviously blown at that point because they're like, he just read our minds, all of ours. And then Jesus goes and he does the miraculous and he says, pick up your mat and walk. And this guy picks up his mat and walks. And then this is what I want to kind of camp on. Because this is the reply, the response of those people. The Bible says this. Check this out. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus goes and he says, pick up your mat and walk. Get up. Listen. He took up his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. Listen, this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The point of my story is this. What started in the Pharisees, what started in the, the people that were sitting around as questions, turned into, get this, a statement of faith. When they were like, what do, you, what do you mean? Who is this guy? How can he say that? How can he do that? Because this thing, people, we get people in here every single week that have questions. We get people in here every single week that their statements or their sentences end with question marks. Who is this God? Who is this one that wants to bring me hope and joy and peace and life abundant? Who is this? It's our job to do whatever we can, to carry whomever we can through our kindness, through our gentleness, through our compassion, through helping in kids' church, through helping in media, through helping in guest services, through helping in, in coffee, in wherever. It's our job to do that so that we can turn people's questions into statements of faith. What if? What if? We chose to be on the outside whom I know the majority of you have on the inside. What if? Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be phenomenal 
if we could play our part, if we could do our thing, if we could help and serve in some capacity so as to turn questions into statements of faith. We started today by having Amy come up here and tell you how much she loves serving in Bridge Kids. And I don't know if you guys know Amy that well, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, kind of fill you in on a bit of her story. But she came to this church not because she was looking, not because she was like seeking God. She came to this church, get this, because she wanted her kids to have their own decision in life. She came to this church on a Sunday about a year and a half ago, two years actually, sat over there, only because her kids were over there. And at the end of service, when I gave, as I do every single week, the opportunity to find faith in Jesus, her hand shot up. She came in, not even with questions, but I'm sure through the service, through the duration of that morning, she was like, what is this? God, who are you? God, what, why am I even here? And she left with a statement of faith that sounded like, I found Jesus. Do you know why she had that opportunity? It's because we had people back there. It's because we had people welcoming her at the door. It's because we had a team of people that were helping put on the service production-wise. So I guess my question is, what can you do to fill an empty seat? What? It's not my decision to say, you need to do this, you need to do that. I think you could be good at this. You should do that. I think that's between you and God. But I think a lot of it just relies on the first statement of simply something like this. God, I want to be known for being part of the truth because of my actions. And so God, would you help me get off the bench today? Today's takeaway My actions can be the difference maker between questions and statements of faith. Hey, you can have a role. You can find your lane. You can have a place in helping fill empty seats. I know you can. And I think you know you can too. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to pray to close the service. And we're going to cut it short a little bit early today. We've got a booth back there with coffee and Timbits and tea, as well as little forms for you even just to, just to look at, just to kind of see what availabilities are there for you to serve. Because I know I say this a, a lot, but you know what? God is more concerned with your availability than your ability. You don't have to be good at something to try it. You don't have to be like, say, well, I, I don't have a degree in teaching kids. I don't care. Kids will love you regardless of how much you know. And we'll train you. Don't worry. I don't, I don't have what it takes. I don't have the ability. You know what? Just, just make yourself available. Because church, for us to reach our city, we got to do this together. We got to be in it to win it. We got to be all in. All of us. My actions can be the difference maker between questions and statements of faith. Let's fill seats. Let me pray.